Rachel Duchant. Welcome to Free Exchange, hosted by the Hammond Institute for Free Enterprise at Lindenwood University. The Hammond Institute fosters free enterprise and civil and religious liberty through the examination of market-oriented approaches to economic and social issues. Today we actually have the director of the Hammond Institute with us, Howard Wall. Hello. Hi. Hi, Rachel. Um, so, um, Howard, you actually do a number of things here at Lindenwood. You're the director of the Institute. You're the director of... The Center for Economics and the Environment, formerly known as the Institute for the Study of Economics and Environment. So flowing a little nicer <laughs> yes. now. And, uh, and you're also chair of the Economics Department. Yes. So. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Because I see that you've been at the Bank of Japan. I see that you've been at the St. Louis Fed. Yeah, no, I actually started my career as an academic research economist at West Virginia University. Then I went to uh, London uh, to teach at Birkbeck College and then 12 years at the Federal Reserve, which was my longest stretch anywhere. Mm -hmm. So I was a regional economist and my uh, job there was to keep an eye on the, the St. Louis economy and other local economies in the, in the middle of the country for the St. Louis Fed. And then I've been at Lindenwood for the last uh, just over two years. Okay, very good. What attracted you to uh, Lindenwood? Well, Lindenwood is, uh, I mean, as a university, it's really on the, on the cusp of, of great things, I think. You I know, think so it's, too, yeah. Uh, really taking off. And uh, there's a lot of opportunity to, uh, like personal opportunity to really do things that I've always wanted to do and get a little bit more involved in mixing uh, academic research with actual policy application, which is something that most academics don't get an opportunity to do or yeah. even, don't even try to do. Right. I've always respected uh, Lindenwood's commitment to s a sort of integrity when it comes to markets. I remember our old president, Dr. Spellman, just refusing to use blight, an eminent domain, in order to uh, get new properties. He wanted to make a contract with those property owners. You know? Yeah, that's right. It's a, so it's a different kind of university. That's right. It's uh. a special place. Um, so first, tell us a little bit about the Center for Economics and the Environment, because uh, whether by that title or no, it's been here for some time. How long? Yes, it's been around since 2002, and it was started by Ken Chilton, who's retired. And uh, the focus really was on bringing kind of free market or economic principles to the natural environment, discussing mm -hmm. policy for the natural environment. And uh, we've expanded that to take advantage of my own background to be kind of the business or environment business environment and the natural environment uh, kind of mm. all together linked. And the environment uh, broadly construed. Yeah, a more, more broad notion of, of the environment. Can, can you give us some examples of the sort of things the CEE has, has done? Well, uh, we, one of the things we do, the main thing that people see is the, uh, our speaker series. We've brought in over the years many speakers, mostly about the environment. And uh, recently, since I've been here, we've doing, been doing more stuff on uh, local policies for economic development, what works, what doesn't work, and uh, largely being kind of a, a, a resource for the media and policymakers in, mm -hmm. in the local area and, in, and statewide. Yeah, I read a print off of one of the speakers that came in several years ago, and he was talking about Enron, and I was really surprised um, at what he was saying about their background, that they had been considered a green company and, yeah. and yeah. so forth, and uh, uh, maybe had u utilized their political connections uh, with that kind of marketing. Oh, it's a, it's a classic case. You have the veneer of, of being green, or you put sustainable in your mission statement, and, right. and you are free of all sorts of uh, inquiries from the federal government. And yet we didn't hear about that with no. the fall of Enron. That wasn't <laughs> something that was emphasized. So right. I thought that was just a fascinating case. And, the kind of thing that's, that the CEE does, and then I suppose monetary policy and other things are Yeah, I, I, like I said, a lot of it is just being a, a resource. I mean, I have a varied background. Maybe I can't pin myself down uh, in what I'm interested in, but that's what I've liked at the mm -hmm. Fed and now, that I can research and discuss a variety of issues, whatever I feel is important at, at the time. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, newspaper reporters or radio reporters, whoever, call me and just discuss what's going on to give them right. kind of background and sometimes directly to contribute to their, their articles. Uh, right. Because there is a lack of understanding in the general public about economics. Uh, everyone, you know, most people maybe took an economics course, found it quite boring, which I don't blame them. The dismal science, it's, it's been sometimes called. It's <laughs> the dreary and dismal science yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But I think a lot of that is that it's not it's, it's not presented uh, in an interesting way because one expression is that economics is, uh, it's not easy, but it's simple. 
Hmm. Uh, so there are a few principles, the guiding principles that you can use that get you very far in understanding how things are going on. So I, I stress that when I talk to talk to people and when I when I teach also. Hmm. Uh, but it is difficult to kind of get over the hump to to see how simple it actually can be. Well, I mean, one of the things that's always struck me about economics is that the truths of economics are sometimes counterintuitive. And yes. so we're constantly having to remind ourselves, oh, it seems like it should work this way, but it doesn't. Yes, so we have a, a different organized common sense. And right. once you get the organization, it then, then follows. But you do have to overcome a lot of preconceptions. So right. a classic th example is uh, with free trade. Economists are universal in saying that free trade between countries is a good idea for both countries. Right. Uh, Mutually advantageous right. exchange. But the, uh, you know, the notion a lot of people have, they're just kind of looking at the, the surface of it, will say, uh, well, we should stop buying things from China so that we'll make them ourselves. Now we have jobs that we've created. Uh, and it's, well, you're, you're not looking beyond what's, go you know, what's going on uh, at the factory where you now have created some jobs. There's a whole other mess that you've created for everybody else in the economy. And, and uh, the opportunity cost of what you could have been right. doing if they, you hadn't been doing that. Those people could be doing yeah. other things mm -hmm. and so on. And, and that second step of the logic is, is not often uh, taken. So right. my role, and it should be, I think, the role of economists who I interact with the public as much as I do, is to just bring them that extra step mm -hmm. to make them think, well, okay, there's a cost to doing that. It's not such, a, such an easy thing, and mm -hmm. be, at least be careful. And then I can maybe take them further. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this same kind of thing uh, as the director of the Liberty and Ethics Center, because you do have a situation in which people who are not economically educated can have very good intentions in putting policies forward and in supporting policies that, that may actually have unintended consequences, may do the opposite of what they're trying to accomplish. And it's often a matter, not a disagreement of values, but a disagreement about facts. Well, and that's exactly the point that's, that's often missed. Uh, you, like minimum wage is another classic case. Economists will say the minimum wage is a really bad idea and it's not because it harms businesses. Personally, it's not, my objective is not really to make businesses do do better. Mm -hmm. It's uh, that it harms the poorest people that it's supposed to be uh, helping out. Now that sounds that sounds insane. Explain it. Yes, it's how can how can you possibly <laughs> you make a law saying pay these people more money? How can that make them worse off? And it's well, their wage actually goes to zero because they become more uh, more expensive to employers, and they don't have the human capital to justify that mm -hmm. expense, so they don't have a job. And not only they don't have that job, but they don't gain the experience to move up the economic ladder. And mm. instead, uh, someone with more skills will uh, might get the job you, instead. You cut off the bottom rung of the ladder. You cut off the, the bottom rung. So the people you are saying that you actually want to help are the ones who are, are harmed most by the policy. Okay, right. And companies are going to cut corners in order to pay that higher wage. So they'll get rid of some employees, they'll get rid of some benefits, they'll get rid of... Right, or they'll uh, mechanize. So there was a, mm. uh, in the news now, there are protests saying that fast food workers should have a $15, hour, $15 an hour minimum wage. And then I, I was reading somewhere a blog post and it said, well, here's the answer to that. And it was a link to a story about a robot that can flip hamburgers. Oh, uh, so, no. <laughs> you know, make the $15 minimum wage, but right. who's better off? Well, the robot manufacturer. Yeah, I remember hearing a story and I can't remember which economist it was, but he visited China and, uh, and some factory owner was taking him around and said, see, we use shovels instead of machines so that we can employ more people. And he said, well, why don't you use spoons? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so it, it's, it's often, it, and I know with myself, I often have to go back and sort of repeat these counterintuitive truths to myself because they do go against the grain of our natural thinking. Yeah, and it's also, you know, uh, sometimes uh, economists, when they do discuss this, they're often seen very negative. Oh, don't do that, don't do that. Mm. But it's always, well, what should we do? And it's, well, the problem isn't, you know, with the minimum wage, say, the problem with people not being able to earn a high wage is that they're not productive because education is poor, right. their education, their experience. So you should work on making the person more productive and valuable and have more opportunities. Yeah, associating capital with that person, right? Yeah. Whether it be education, yeah, skills, make, et cetera. Make firms want to hire that person, mm -hmm. not pass a law 
trying to require them to hire them and pay them a certain wage, make right. that person valuable in, in the market, and they will, be, they will be hired. Well, and another counterintuitive thing, I think, is that we want to have a law or a policy that's going to make good things happen, but in fact, good things happen in a more spontaneous way. It's more by allowing people to use their creativity and be able to easily do things like start a new business, and so forth that you see an economy start to really gain some momentum. And that's not something you can generate in a, in a centrally planned way. It's something you have to sort of let allow to happen by creating a good infrastructure. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's you need the, the, like the, the good business environment for business to thrive. Right. You don't need uh, local and national bureaucrats ordering around the resources uh, because they don't know anything about uh, how to run a business. Right. And uh, you know, in some ways, they I'm, you know, it's a it's a mystery, in some ways, why governments continue to think that they they should step in uh, to direct things. But um, usually, it's these things generate because individuals will uh, take the opportunities that are presented to them. And if yeah. you give opportunities, then the need will be filled. I, you know, I think it's kind of a human weakness that you see in general um, in other areas of life as well, which is the idea that there's got to be something I can do to solve this directly. It's just sort of it gives us a sense of control, I think. You know, maybe it's a kind of a dysfunction. <laughs> well, some, it's, I don't know if it's an, sometimes it's kind of an ego trip. It's I'm responsible for that. So exactly. there's classic, classic cases of states giving tax breaks to set up a business. And then they take credit for having created that business because I gave that tax break and it mm. existed. Almost all of those businesses would have existed without the government giving out the money. It's just giving them free money. Then uh, you can kind of pat yourself on the so back. So everyone, <laughs> the, the two parties are benefiting, everyone yeah. but the taxpayer and consumers are benefiting uh, because the, the bureaucrat pats himself on the back and says, you know, I'm responsible for, mm -hmm. for these, these people having jobs, you know, thank me. And then the business people uh, have more money in their checking account. Right, right. Okay, so we need to take a break now, but when we come back, we'll discuss the Hammond Institute, which is the overarching institute that the three centers are housed in. Uh, so we'll be back with you in a moment. Hi, we're back with Free Exchange, and we're talking to our guest, Howard Wall, who is the director of the Hammond Institute and the Center of Economics and the Environment. Um, or Center for Economics and the Environment. Uh, so Howard, um, tell us about the Hammond Institute. What is its structure? What is its mission? Well, the Hammond Institute, we uh, just started this summer because of a very generous gift from John uh, Hammond, who has been a, uh, on the board of directors of Lindenwood for, uh, for many years. And uh, it's really a great timing for it because there were disparate things going on. That's disparate, not desperate. Disparate <laughs> things going on at Lindenwood that could come together under uh, a single umbrella and we could kind of you know, market ourselves together and you know, kind of pool our resources to really make a bigger impact on uh, the university and on maybe the students and the general public as, as a whole. So we have uh, three uh, centers that comprise the, the institute. There's the Your Liberty and Ethics Center. Right. And the Ideas Wing. The I Ideas like to say. Wing. <laughs> and then there's the Center for Economics and the Environment, which mm -hmm. is my other mm -hmm. other role. The Policy Wing. And uh, the Dury Center for Entrepreneurship, was, right. which is the practical. Yeah, the applied, wing, right? And the yeah. applied wing, where it's really directly trying to get uh, students and others, you know really involved in, the, in free enterprise, doing free enterprise, right. not just, not just uh, thinking talking about it, about it or <laughs> thinking about it. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, wonderful. Um, so one might ask what the purpose or mission of the Institute is. What's the, what's the point of having an organization like this? Well, the mission over, overall is really just to, uh, you know, really take a close look at free market or free enterprise uh, options for solving some of society's problems right. instead of the what's become to be more usual, which is to quickly turn to government to pass a law to uh, supposedly uh, address a problem. Uh, because often those problems interfere with the market and make the situation uh, even worse mm -hmm. and sometimes does do the, you know, does the opposite of what may or may not have been actually 
in t intended. Which, of course, can also cause problems for civil liberties and religious liberties. Right, and that's, you know, and we're it, I, think, I think the three centers really meld, uh, meld together because there are different aspects uh, right. to this. Uh, as an economist, I can say this is inefficient uh, to have the government step in, and then there's a moral dimension to it also. Right. It's, well, the, the individual is not able to express themselves and right. make themselves uh, 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 as you know, be as happy as they could be for whatever reason. Or what is the real impact on the least well-off, for right. instance? And, yeah. and, uh, and the DeRee Center uh, can say, well, what, how does a, an individual maneuver through uh, the, the economy as an entrepreneur, and how do they get, get over hurdles and, and so on? So it, I think they really mix together quite well. Right. And uh, a lot of that, the fact that it mixes is somewhat of a coincidence, but we took advantage of the opportunity presented of what we were already doing at Lindenwood and gathered it together, and I think we can really take off and have an well, impact. And the element uh, in which it's not coincidental is I think that Lindenwood University does attract, uh, I think, a certain approach to life, you know? And so we had a couple of things already happening that just gel in this sort of an environment. Yeah, oh, it's a, it's a perfect match of what individuals were already doing as right. faculty and what the university is all about and what mm -hmm. our, our donor really wanted to and also what's, I think, needed in, in society and also for our, our students. Yeah, I mean, actually, the, uh, the person who named the DeRee Center, Rick DeRee, is a good example. He was a student here. Uh, a student of entrepreneurship, became a successful entrepreneur, actually serves our students in the book exchange, and, uh, and then has now gotten into the encouragement of new entrepreneurs. And yes. I think he yeah. saw Lindenwood as a place that would really welcome his efforts. Yeah, no, you, you get into Lindenwood and you realize it's a very different place and almost all of the differences are good differences. Yes, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so the Hammond Institute is gonna be doing some things and the various centers this coming year. Um, and, and maybe long term. Can you talk to us about what sort of activities? Well, the first thing is our, our big launch, which is happening on September 26, which is a Thursday. And uh, at three in the afternoon, we're having Stephen Moore, who is a, a nationally known economist and uh, editor, one of the editors of the Wall Street Journal. And he was the founder of the Club for Growth. So he's going to uh, give our, our keynote address at our, our big launch. Mm -hmm. So we're very excited about, uh, about him coming. And we also have Joe Haslick, who is an economist at uh, University of Missouri, and also um, Brenda Talent, who is at the Show Me Institute, uh, director at the Show Me Institute, to uh, to give brief talks also. So we're very excited as a as a big launch to uh, show what we're we're all about and to. Uh, bring in a big audience and kick things off. I like coordinating with other institutions of learning, other in think tanks and institutes. Um, that's exciting. And, and I noticed that Stephen Moore's next book is co-written with Arthur Laffer. That's right. He, uh, he's written with Arthur Laffer a couple of times. Yeah. And... Uh, who we famously know the Laffer Curve, right? Uh, which we associate with probably the presidency of Ronald Reagan, right? right. So it's a uh, and Mo Mo Stephen Moore is younger, so he's maybe the newer generation of that. Okay. That type of uh, popular uh, free market economist. Right. So we think, okay, we need more money. Let's raise taxes. But then you have the problem that it's perhaps uh, you can dampen you're, you're the perhaps you're actually reducing taxes because you're dampening. Yeah. Uh, entrepreneurship and the economic growth, so you end up with not as much money as right. you Right, you think, why should thought. I work hard to get a raise if it's all gonna be taxed away, right. I'll relax. Yes, and one of their, <laughs> one of their big uh, issues now, and I think their book is about how, and I know their past, most recent books have been about how uh, the burden of taxation and just the distortions of the tax code are really holding the economy back. Mm. And that just is, keeps getting, uh, getting worse over the last few years. Sometimes I just think about the amount of time and energy we spend doing our taxes, getting around, ta you know, thinking about what's deductible, how I'm going to arrange my affairs in order to be efficient with regard to taxes. Whew, it's a lot. Yeah, it's, it's incredible because the tax code is uh, thousands upon thousands of pages. And even our former uh, uh, Treasury Secretary, who was the uh, head of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, was unable to do his own, own taxes <laughs> and was... Oh, what a uh, commentary. <laughs> was, ...was nabbed. Or I guess he apologized for not being able to do his own taxes. <laughs> uh, but right. since under his reign, the tax code became even more complex. So 
Uh, I think it goes on for miles. And and I was surprised to learn that in spite of the fact that we think of America as being, you know, more minimal government than Europe, for instance, our corporate tax levels are way above theirs. It's the highest in the developed world. Our t uh, corporate tax highest corporate tax rate is 35 percent and that is easily the highest uh, I think among it's something like 10 countries. percentage points above the average European right corporate tax and so you think what are the incentives we're offering there for people to house their businesses you well know, their and there are so many distortions here. in the tax code you make a very high tax rate and this gives the federal government a lot of opportunity to give uh, uh, special deals hand out favors mm in terms of tax breaks you and, can pick and so who on. you want to encourage and right who you we'll want give to you a discount on your taxes if you build a uh, hundred wind farms i see okay so things right. like that so right. it's spending through the tax the corporate tax code and the individual tax right, code right everything being sort of controlled from that perspective right so so as the hammond institute um goes into its fall lineup um i'm interested to hear what you as an economist think about the the economic recovery because I imagine we'll be discussing it quite a bit in our in our meetings this fall. Uh, yes, uh, I'm afraid we will. I'm, I say I'm afraid we will because it's it's very depressing. Yeah. I've been talking about our recovery for uh, several years now because it's the recession ended in uh, June of 2009, and this is 2013, and this is the weakest recovery in our in our history, mm. uh, at least in the last 70, 80 years. Uh, weaker, it, it rivals the Great Depression in its weakness, and uh, it, there just seems to be no, currently no end in sight, because in my own view, the policies that have been pursued uh, at the federal level have been almost always the opposite of what will get the economy going. Okay, so just to clarify, when you say that the recovery is weak, you're talking about the employment levels? Employment levels, GDP levels, mm -hmm. uh, business startups, whatever measure you want to look at. It is a historically slow recovery. Yeah. And the fact is that when you, ha and the excuse is that, well, we had a very deep uh, recession, uh, and therefore it's harder to get out of it. And it's, well, it might take longer to get out of it, but uh, the, the strong pattern is the deeper the recession, the stronger the recovery. The more rapid, mm. you, rapidly you get out of the doldrums. And historically, we have had some very deep recessions, and we've kind and of we bounced, bounced back. back. Yeah. So the, the most recent recession that rivals this one was the was a, a pair of recessions in the early 80s, and the policies pursued then under President Reagan uh, were basically the opposite of what. Um, uh, been pursued the last few years. Right. You know, it was shrink to government, mm -hmm. uh, go the opposite direction at least on government, and uh, loosen regulations and simplify, you know, finally simplifying yeah. the tax code. And make things easier for people so that production can. Right. And can the recovery go uh, took off. It was much faster. So we currently have employment growth. They're thrilled when employment growth is 175,000 a month, which is really a pathetic number. Oh. The scaled number during the Reagan recovery was something like 500 to 600,000 per month. And that's recovery. Wow. At the rate we're going, it will be another 12, 15 years before we recover well, the employment I, level to where it should be. And knowing, you know, having a few acquaintances that are unemployed, um, you know, you'll hear arguments that, well, I think we're bouncing back, you know, it's picked up a little bit. And, and I, my friends are saying, I can't tell, you know, and, and, and even sending out graduates into the job market. GDP growth of under 2% and employment, monthly employment growth of less than 450,000 mm -hmm. is, you know, half of, of what is needed is, is what they get happy about, is, is not a recovery. That is limping along. So this is a little depressing. Can that, you give I us any hope? I said it was hope? depressing, and I wasn't looking forward to talking about it all the time. Yeah. Can you give us any hope? Is there a positive side? Is there a recommendation? Well, the, it's, it's actually, uh, I think it's straightforward. It's not that difficult to uh, straighten things out in terms of knowing what the policies are. Mm -hmm. It's uh, simplify the tax code, lower the tax rates, get rid of the, a lot of the tax uh, deductions, um, stop over-regulating. Uh, uh, all of the sectors that are becoming more and more regulated. Right. So basically undo much of what's been done over the last, you know, I don't want to say just under President Obama, but there's been a creep in regulation and taxation and distortions in the tax code over the last 15 years. Okay. So there is a, 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 a free market way to get out of this, 
and we're doing the opposite, then we see the, the results of that. Right. And more broadly, I think uh, it's easy for us to, in America, to um, spend time arguing about what particular regulations we want or this amount of regulation or deregulation. Um, but as people have begun to ask me about the mission of the Hammond Institute, um, I've also emphasized, you know, the sort of global vision. There are many places that don't have even the appreciation of the basic institutions that allow for a capitalist economy to, to flourish. And so we don't just talk about the minutia of American policy. We're also thinking on a broader level of, um, I, I just read yesterday an article that Bono, you know, the singer from right. U2, right. has changed his mind on foreign aid and is saying, yeah, aid might be some kind of a stopgap, but we need Africa to become an economic powerhouse. Exactly. It's the, you know, teach a man to whatever to fish, the fish expression right. is. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and uh, and I, I was very happy uh, that he, he came to that realization. And I think more yeah. people have to because the United States did not become rich because we received foreign aid from Britain. <laughs> we became rich because we had open markets and we right. were open to investment from Britain and elsewhere and internally and we uh, prospered because of that. Yeah. And there's no reason to keep other countries down because of our bad ideas. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Howard. And uh, this has been Free Exchange. I hope you enjoyed our discussion today. And if you did, check out the Hammond Institute for Free Enterprise at www.lindenwood.edu slash Hammond Institute. Thank you.